Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being here this morning. I feel louder than ever. Um, just forgive me while I sort my notes out just slightly, because I, I know that we have a number of people who have come in today. So firstly, uh, let me please uh, acknowledge the elders and descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been and are the custodians of these lands. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet today is a place of age-old ceremonies, a celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. I therefore pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging. Uh, just again to remind people of some housekeeping. Um, if you need the parents' room, it's just off to the left of the stage. There are, of course, toys uh, and a live feed from the proceedings here, uh, should you need that. Uh, and of course, if there are any questions throughout the day, uh, please get in touch uh, with either Justine, myself, Anna, or any of the fabulous team for JT Productions. Uh, so it's my delight to introduce our first session for today, uh, in which, if I find my notes, I'll be able to give actually the title of uh, Career Patterns, uh, the Research Outcomes. And we have two uh, people who absolutely know their fields uh, back to front. Um, I'll be in introducing um, to the stage, I think one by one, but then we will have a brief session for questions together, uh, Valerie Francis and Jill Mathewson. Uh, Professor Valerie Francis is a pre the Chair of Construction Management here at the University. Uh, and she's an extraordinary expert on gender issues uh, within the construction profession. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have her here uh, today to talk about that. So, Valerie, please, welcome. Thank you. The, the slides have been put in the reverse order. Oh, so really? Oh, no. So, my apologies. <laughs> so, let me just appear to sort of move seamlessly on. <laughs> Then can I welcome the fabulous Jill Mathewson to the stage, who is a researcher uh, based at Monash University and co-founder of Parla, uh, who has, um, knows probably more about the makeup of the Australian architecture profession uh, than anybody else in the entire universe. Me? Yes! Jill, please, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Right, let's get going. So I called my uh, PhD Dimensions of Gender, and it looked at uh, careers in, for women in the Australian uh, profession. I was kind of playing a bit with the word uh, dimensions, first in terms of measurement, how many women were there and where are they? And then I looked at career dimensions, and if you get stuck into career literature, they talk about dimensions quite a lot. And sociologist uh, Julie, Julia Evers describes how researchers will often consider careers in only one dimension, such as what you can do pr to progress your career, like be more assertive, network more, lean in, all that kind of stuff. And there is uh, some value in that kind of, um, those kind of sessions, especially if your family, education and experience have socialised you to be more communal rather than exercise agency, which is a classic binary and it's very closely aligned to the gender binary. But they can be in the kind of mode of fix the woman because they're a bit faulty, um, which, you know, is really... Not, not good. So, because um, the pursuit of any kind of career involves navigating really complex structural and cultural dimensions, and they exist in the workplace and in the profession. So, as we all know, in architecture, there's a set of shared beliefs, expectations, and restrictions embedded in the ideologies of what architectures, architects should be and what architecture should be. But gender, which is, of course, the social and cultural processes of uh, process of beliefs, expectations, and restrictions about what me women and men are and should be, strongly infects these dimensions. So what happens when these two structural and cultural multi-dimensional um, systems collide? 
So that was the main kind of focus of my um, thesis. Right. So um, when I first started my PhD, um, there was a definite vibe from friends and colleagues of, isn't that gender stuff a bit last century? This is a diagram that launched a thousand, uh-oh, not so last century after all. It's a visualisation of all the statistics that Kirsty Voltz and I dug up, showing the proportion of women in different parts of the discipline. The bigger the bubble, the more women. Junior roles to the left and senior roles to the right, where they just get smaller and smaller. Uh, and we also have this diagram. The, the white circle is the approximate proportion of um, uh, women graduates in that age group, and the peach circle in between is the proportion of women uh, from the census. And you can see that peach circle contracting within the white, meaning that women are leaving. Well, this chart here, which is a kind of update, shows there's been some considerable growth over the last few years. Uh, look at that jump for professors of architecture from 12% in 2011 to 33% in 2016. That's massive. Um, uh, and there's a few of them in the room, I think. Uh, and not to mention a few of them who were associated with the original um, project that my PhD grew out of. Um, so while we do have this considerable growth, it doesn't mean that architecture is uh, rapidly moving towards uh, gender e equality. Because as much as I'm a numbers nerd or a data diva on a good day, numbers aren't everything. Numerical equality is not the same as gender equality. In particular, statistics don't reveal much of the nuances of the cultural and structural dimensions and forces that lead to all these kind of deflating bubbles as women get more senior. It matters how, as well as how many women are participating. To look at that, I, to look at that kind of how, I did an uh, ethnographic study of three architectural practices in Sydney, quite large practices, across the three offices that there were 254 people with architectural education. I interviewed a lot of them, way too many of them, uh, women and men, and chatted to and observed a lot more. They have worked all over the world as, in, as well as in um, different practices in Australia. And look, everybody knows Leonard Cohen's song. Um, the point is there's lots of women in architecture school and there's fewer, fewer later on. Yeah, everyone knows that, said one guy. Um, from a younger woman, when you first graduated, there's lots to learn and you don't worry about things, but after a while, you begin to wonder, what's going on here? And then from one of my more pithy um, uh, interviewees, a senior woman, she said, I'm not being cynical, I'm just observant. You can see the patterns. So let's have a look at the patterns from those 254 people. Um, you can tell that I like circles in my infographics. Um, so here they are divided by cohorts, years since graduation, because age and seniority kind of really matter. Um, and then uh, this is a gender breakdown of those. So more or less, um, they kind of follow the range of what the census and graduation rates tell us, except for cohort one, which is only 40%, which is a lot lower than, than it should be. But in a way, that's quite a volatile cohort, so I didn't worry about that quite so much. Um, and what about seniority? So I spread them out over OK, here we go. Spread them out over um, uh, owners on the, on the right-hand side there, right down to students on, on the left-hand side there. And you can kind of see that the more years you've been out, the more senior you are, which should, is as to be expected, or one, or one would hope. And then let's have a look at the gender breakdown. There we go. OK. Um, there's a percentage, and you can see there's a considerable drop from the associate level at 35% to um, uh, senior associates, 18%. 
And I also watched the promotions over the two years I was studying these firms, and that barrier became very, very clear. Uh, women didn't have a problem being promoted to associate. They were over half the promotions to associate in that time, but only a quarter of those promoted to level B. Um, ownership is a bit of a different beastie there, just two women. Um, but it's less about promotion and more about are you able to contribute to the pot of money uh, of, by landing really big jobs. And gender can play a part when client groups for big projects tend to be men, um, which it is for a lot of commercial projects, but not so much for the um, social infrastructure kind of projects. My interviewees had interviewed women at the top from not just these fir firms, but ones around the world. Uh, and universally, they were all considered exceptional. But that meant they were quite difficult professional role models for junior women, as they set really high benchmarks. Although their um, presence did um, demonstrate that such lives were possible. But it was also true that the women at the top, uh, and it's not just these two, were still too few to avoid some really banal gender stereotyping. So notably, they were either superwomen or they were queen bees, really um, the latter being a bit unpleasant and no one wanted to be like that. Um, but of course, not everyone wants to be at that topmost level. There's a level of kind of hustling which is um, not everyone's comfortable with. Um, but a number of the women at level B seem to be operating on a better the devil you know basis, indicating that um, they weren't quite sure whether they would be able to transfer to another um, uh, workplace because they thought they would have to start all over again. And that's a classic for women, that um, men are kind of judged on their potential and women have to prove themselves again and again. Uh, coupled with age, this seemed to keep the senior women from leaving the firms at the time. But since, quite a few of those women have left. And it actually had to do with not being valued, and that was unrelated to salary. Um, and I think there has been a shift in the last five, six years. The wider profession is seeing senior women as valuable, and they want them, and they're, they're after them. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm actually going to talk about um, what I thought was a, a major structural and cultural issue and how it interacted with gender. Um, I called it uh, project devotion. Clearly, architecture is to do with projects. It's on projects that a portfolio, a career, and a reputation are built. And we learn to prov uh, devote ourselves to projects starting at architecture school, but it moves into the profession, and the imperative of the project is consistently promoted. My interviewees spoke of staying in a firm or leaving it because of project, the projects they might get, of ambition, not for themselves, but for the project, of tolerating long hours, poor pay, and frankly, illegal work conditions because of the project, of allegiance not to the firm, but to the project, and of delaying having children to complete a project. And why not? Projects are diverse and complex, absorbing and exciting, an intellectual challenge of problem solving, negotiating the myriad complexities of technical requirements, not to mention some really interesting social interactions and relationships. And architecture is a lifestyle, isn't it? You know, we're always checking things out online. We arrange our holidays to visit buildings. And it's all in the service of the next project. But projects can also be absolutely relentless. And the more you give, sometimes the more they can take. There was a little bit of a sub-theme within project devotion that emerged from the interviewees, that to create architecture means to always do more more than what your fellow students are doing. That sound familiar? Um, more than what the clients might expect and more than what other architects might do, which is one of the reasons that long hours are part and parcel of project devotion. And when gender collides with project devotion, things become particularly unstuck for women. And again and again, I heard that the reason why there were so few new senior women or older women in architecture was because, oh, they had kids. That was a very unsubtle whatever. Um, and 
Because having children set up a competing devotion for women, but not for men. The same old patterns of the gender division of labour kick in, and they kick hard. Women should devote themselves to the children, and the men should work hard to provide for the family. If um, women had children, uh, they were automatically and often unquestioned uh, excluded from the good roles on good projects because of the assumed time demands. And they also excluded themselves. Um, but importantly, for those without children, just the potential to have children could remove you from the good roles on the good projects. And this was often um, framed as a business decision. Yeah, but it is actually more than maternity. Project devotion also contributes to a tolerance of weak management uh, processes because there's some distrust of processes that might encroach on the project devotion imperative. Consequently, informal work practices tended to dominate the key moments that contribute to career advancement. And study after study shows that gender bias is more prevalent in informal processes. So um, if we look at the different cohorts, in cohort one, the idea that architecture work is demanding but really enjoyable um, and worthy, worthy of devotion was very strong. Being female was not actually seen as inconsistent with being an architect, but being a mother certainly was. They just could not see how you could be an architect and a mother. As one young woman put it, Quote, I know the female side of it is all going to be messy, but like it's not want, like I want to think about now. But the young men were also wary of the impact of architecture on their desire to be a parent. One said, I like what I do, but it's not like I'm passionate about it to the, to the point where I'd slash and burn my family. And another who was the son of an architect and had seen the damage uh, firsthand hoped that there was another way to practice. Uh, without all those sacrifices. And I like that hope, but um, whether these sentiments will survive the cultural and the structural um, imperatives of the profession is another matter. Cohorts one and two were where uh, a lack of formal development procedures allowed the distribution of opportunities, which is so critical to the development of a budding architect to be highly informal and therefore uh, prone to gender bias. Not as well as uh, racial bias, um, socioeconomic bias, whole range of biases kick in. Being competent is just not enough. The assertive and the confident moved ahead, and these tended to be men who had more leeway to perform confidence without being classified as pushy. Um, those in cohort two were very valuable members of staff, experienced enough to shoulder responsibility and eager to accept it. As such, heavy and time-demanding uh, workloads were described as individual choice. It's, it's my choice to work hard on this project. I actually saw them as more structural, a product of the internal office or construction industry mismanagement, and often because uh, brutal fee cutting had meant that teams were severely un understaffed. Um, with more responsibility, there was also more exposure to the male-dominated um, environment outside of the firms, the three Cs, clients, consultants, and contractors, and who could be great to work with or a total nightmare, uh, depending in a way on how these um, uh, groups, uh, how put out they were by having a woman in the room. There was also intense competition in this cohort for the good roles on the good projects. Some interviewees, particularly women, moved to specialisations to kind of sidestep that because it could get vicious, and I've written about that in the parlour post. Um, by adding value to their skills, by being specialist, uh, they, uh, they were distinguished from other staff and they it could possibly improve their continued employment prospects. And this especially mattered when women embarked on motherhood um, and it, it affected their ability to uh, return after a maternity break. Um, their relationship with senior people in the firm also mattered. Being known and trusted 
powerfully ex expected your options for returning. Um, one practice manager told me that, you know, if a woman goes on maternity leave, if they're a really good producer and of work, um, they'll try really hard to keep them. If they're not so good, they won't try so hard. Um, those in cohort three and four had come kind of reconciled to the profession, its ways of working and their own careers. They were not so much less project devoted, but had wrangled an understanding of it that was more nuanced and negotiated. And they'd also broadened their conception of what an architect was beyond the idealised project architect. They worked with and around large firms, taking advantage of the firm's structures to practice the way they wanted and on the kind of um, projects uh, that such work, uh, firms provided. Um, when I began the PhD, I assumed uh, a bit pessimistically and cynically, because, you know, we often get to that stage in architecture, um, that architecture was much worse than any other profession, that it particularly in, uh, discouraged women participants. But the more I looked, and I looked at other professions, um, it seemed that the same gendered patterns appeared, and the architecture profession was not quite so unique. But the reasons given for those patterns uh, differ from those of other professions. And it's the dimensions of those reasons and extremities that I started to try and untangle. So um, all architects uh, draw lines, but are perhaps less aware of the lines they draw to contain themselves within the profession and that limit them and the profession. Uh, these lines exclude some and include others. But these lines, because they're formed by the kind of social structure of architecture, um, are not fixed and um, they're, uh, this, because they're socially constructed. Um, so the profession's always in a bit of flux. And so the challenge for the women and men of the profession uh, and everyone in this room is that although the lines are negotiated, they can, like the lines in your CAD pro program, snap very quickly to a grid of gender bias. And that's what we've got to kind of counter. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I've had my earlier introduction. Um, just to remind you again, my name's Valerie Francis. I'm, uh, I work here at the University of Melbourne. I'm a ch the chair in construction. I'm an engineer by background, so my slides look like something that a kindergarten student did. So my apologies for that. So uh, I'm just going to be talking to you today a bit about um, this uh, a career typology model that I've developed for professional women in the built environment. And to a certain extent, I'm just going to go very briefly through a little bit of background, a little bit on the research, focus a bit more on the role of inclusion. Uh, this um, concept that I've developed, the gender inclusivity continuum, which is a bit of a mouthful, and from that, uh, um, I developed a career typology model uh, and then some conclusions. So really, if we have a look at um, the background information of women in the built environment, a lot of it really investigates barriers to women so, uh, and reasons for women underachieving, rather than saying, well, to a certain extent, some women are achieving things. And when we have a look at it, you, um, very much the dominant themes in that research is that there's a, a strong masculine culture that isn't good for women, uh, the sexual discrimination. You know, often women are lacking mentors and networks. If they had those things, they would be advancing. Uh, there's low organisational support. Women often move around a bit more than the men do. Uh, and really, um, an overarching theme of, you know, if you want to succeed in this industry, you've got to really just fit into this dominant culture. A lot of these studies have really been qualitative in nature, um, and they're based on women themselves reflecting on why they may not have advanced, or men, male managers reflecting on why women are not advancing. And if we have a look at these barriers, um, low organisational support, lack of mentors, lack of networks, access to networks, uh, masculine culture, a lot of these are really outside of women's control. Um, and, but we do know that some women are advancing, so really what are the factors that affect their advancement? So that was the nature of this study. And I started off by asking the question, what are the individual, 
interpersonal and organisational factors that affect um, professional women's career advancement in the built environment. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, this was a cross-sectional quantitative study. It was um, uh, collected most of the data online, which was great. And I ended up having a sample of nearly 460 managerial and professional women. Um, so this is actually considered the largest study internationally on women. Uh, and approximately half of those were in contracting positions and the other half were sort of in consulting positions. So in project management, in architecture, there was about 120 architects, etc. So it's taking the, the, the um, view of, the, of um, the built environment. And this is, um, so why did I look at these individual, interpersonal, organisational? This is my theoretical framework, um, which, was, which is from the organisational psychology field. And this looks at where people um, develop power. Uh, you develop power at the individual level, at the interpersonal, between you and others, uh, you're at the organisational level and at societal level. And really, when we look at careers, we, can, we, we say that the societal factors are fairly standard for everybody, and then we're really just looking at those three different states. So I started off this study by really looking at these different variables. I had to, first of all, develop a scale to measure career advancement, and then I had to um, actually... Uh, then I measured things at the individual level, so I broke them down into family variables, human capital variables, personal variables, um, so how proactive your personality is, you know, do you have career aspirations, what's your career planning like, etc. Those interpersonal ones, so uh, intra-organisational resources or networks, uh, being mentored, uh, super, you know, and then at the organisational level. And very quickly, what came out of the results really is that when we take all of the factors into account, it's the individual factors that have the greatest effect on women's careers. And really, these interpersonal and organisational factors have no real effect. So in other words, having a mentor, not having a mentor, having networks, not having networks, actually had no effect on women's career advancement. So that's climbing up the, the hierarchy within the organisation. They very, were very important because they were very significantly correlated with things like lower turnover intent and career satisfaction, which we know is very important to women. Um, so it keeps women in and stops the leaky pipeline, but it doesn't necessarily uh, um, influence their career advancement. When we looked at the individual factors separately, it was really the human capital variables that made the greatest uh, impact. And that gives us an idea of the patterns of women that advance. They tend to stay in an organisation a long time. They have long tenure but they also have been in quite a number of organisations. They've got quite a lot of inter-organisational movement. Um, they tend to be educated, they tend to put in the work hours, and they've got development opportunities on the way, and they've got good work experience. So these are sort of all reflective of what we refer to as contest mobility. So in other words, um, it's based on your own abilities, um, why you advance. We do know that, um, I didn't study men in this, uh, in this uh, it was just looking at women, but we know from all the other studies uh, that, that men typically experience sponsored mobility. So in other words, they're identified early based on early success, given a bit of a gold star on the head and then given opportunities. And that's why those networks and those mentors often are of assistance. And in a way, maybe that's why these qualitative studies don't necessarily pick up this, because people are reflecting on other people who are advancing, who are typically men, and, um, or, or men are um, reflecting on their own advancement patterns. So this was sort of some interesting uh, research. And then really, what, where does that leave you? Um, so I decided to have a look at this uh, framework which was developed by Diana Billamora and she sort of said, look, for women to really advance, for them to really get on, they actually need two things. They need to have a level of um, influence over their um, careers, so that's how they use their personal authority and effectiveness to benefit the organisation. And then she said they also have to have a level of inclusion. Um, and she talked about inclusion as being how well integrated women were within their setting so that they could use their um, 
uh, their, 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 their um, skills more effectively. So she said that really this group up here, group three, the socialised achievers were the ones that would advance more. So in other words, they've got high influence as well as high inclusion. And really this group down here with low inclusion you know, they'd be striving, they, but they'd never quite get there. And really, this is the sort of the sweet spot. So I tested that out. Um, and um, using Bill Amora's description of what she meant by influence and what she meant by inclusion, I developed some composite measures which I standardised because everything's measured on a different scale. So when you standardise a variable, you make it the mean is at zero. So basically, I could say, well, um, above zero, they had high influence. Below zero, they had low influence. Above zero, they had high inclusion. Below zero, they had low inclusion. So I could split the group into four. So I could split them in by, by their um, level of inclusion, how they felt, and then also um, by their level of influence. So this is really what I found. So really, this is the sweet spot up here. This is the women advancing more, and if you can see, They've advanced no more. In fact, they're slightly less, but they're statistically significantly not different at all. So in other words, influence has an effect on advancement. Uh, advancement's measured on the six-point scale, just so you know. So that, you know, here you've got lower advancement, but it's no more by being in this high inclusion group. So then you're left with a sort of the question, you know, what on earth is sort of going on with these groups and what's actually happening? And luckily, I came across um, a model by Shaw which talked about inclusion, being culture inclusion or gender inclusion, really having two elements to it. And what were those two elements? One was this sense of belonging. So um, you could have a group which were the outsiders and the insiders. So the outsiders and the insiders. And you could also, um, you could say, well, real inclusion occurs down here when we've got a high value on the uniqueness that you're bringing from as a cultural group or as a, 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 a or from your gender. And really, um, if if you've got a low value in your uniqueness, you're either in an excluded group or you're in an assimilated group. Um, so, um, so these were the sort of the three main categories. This is a smaller category. These are people who are not the in the in group, but they've got a high value. So they're often, you know, somebody who's got incredible knowledge about, you know, uh, a particular small thing, highly valued, but maybe not a social insider. And they tend to be a very small group. So I came up with this idea that um, really there's these three main groups. And if we think about women, uh, if, if, they, if, if we think about men, men have inclusion within their organisation. We just have to open up Engineers Australia magazine, probably the architects thing. We know that men have inclusion. We know they rise to the top. Um, and they're treated as insiders. There's a value placed on the unique attributes that they bring. And really what I sort of came up with this idea is that really there's this gender inclusivity continuum, which reflects um, interestingly on what Justine um, was talking about yesterday. And really, um, women uh, have uh, often what's written in the academic literature is that women are very much excluded. But I think really these days, we've got a group that are reasonably well assimilated. So in other words, they're insiders, but they're still not valued for the unique contribution. And I think what we've seen is a, a first generational change. My, at my age, I was very experienced in this exclusion category. And, it's, and, and to a certain extent, I see this as a good news story <laughs> that in fact, it's moved on a bit. Uh, for a lot of, I mean, I'm, as, I'm an angry old woman as well. But um, so, so we've got this first um, generation cultural change, but this next stage where we actually have an increased value uh, a value placed on what women uniquely bring to projects is the next stage in this um, uh, continuum. And really, if we have a look at wh what I actually measured when I looked at Diana Billamora's and she had socialised ach uh, achievers as, as being the higher group, well, really, that was all about belonging or social inclusion. And really, now, if I split these two groups rather than exclusion and inclusion to exclusion and assimilation, we can sort of say, well, although being in an assimilated group doesn't actually 
help you climb the slippery pole of success, it does actually mean that you actually have a much higher level of career satisfaction. And we know that's really important to women, so that's a good thing. Uh, we also know it's a much higher level of job satisfaction. So certainly being in this group is a much better uh, place to be. We also know that um, the type of organisations that we've got in this assimilation category, we know it's got more women overall, it's got more women who are in leadership. Um, people have a much lower uh, turnover intent, they're not going to leave these organisations. More of them, uh, statistically more of them are being mentored and they have better work-family conflict. So we know this is a much better place to be than in the other location. So from this I then developed this career typology model, which is just sort of saying, look, really, I think we've probably got six categories, four of which we've got at the moment, but two of which we haven't quite got to. This is about to hit social media. <laughs> and um, to a certain extent, um, I guess when I started my career, there were, many, there were some senior women, but they were still subordinate. So I see it as a good news story. And then the, we've got the successful strugglers. So they're, they're successful, they're as equally successful as these people over here by external means, but they actually are struggling with life. They, they've got low satis jobs, uh, life satisfaction. I, I don't know if the giggles are good or bad, but the, um, and they, um, <laughs> and they uh, you know, they've got terrible work-life family, conflict, et cetera, et cetera. So they're the ones that, that are gonna either, you know, they might leave actually. The assimilation, uh, so these ones here have moved around and eventually stayed, even though they've stayed in a company that isn't actually that great for them. The acclimatised achiever and the grateful participant, I say grateful because they know this person over here, and they know what an awful life they've got, and they basically, they're quite happy, at least they're in, and they're, it's not too bad. And then the acclimatised achiever is, they're almost so acclimatised that they don't really realise that they're not actually being valued for what they uniquely bring. They've got to modify themselves a bit in order to fit in, um, and, and really, um, they say things like, no, sponsorship does, sponsorships help me, uh, you know, I, I definitely, it's definitely my mentors help me. But we basically, we know, then when they continue carrying on and talking, they say, that's because I was going to leave the industry last year. So it really is very much related to this keeping women in the industry. So I, I'm always a very strong advocate for mentorship, etc. But it doesn't have the same effect for, for women. And then when we have true inclusion, this is where we could have the satisfied aspirant or the contented succeeder. And really, we need cultural changes. As we know, cultural change comes with transformational leadership. Who are good transformational leaders? Uh, women. So to a certain extent, the more women we get in, the more, more chance we have of actually getting to um, an, an inclusion sort of stage. So um, just in case you're interested, where do the architects sit? Uh, engineering companies in general were a bit more socially inclusive than the architectural companies, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, and construction, which you probably wouldn't have um, been surprised at, was, was, was the lowest at the levels of social inclusion. So really what this is saying is that women don't get the gold star on their head. Uh, they don't, they have a contest mobility. I still see this as being relatively positive. Um, so they're promoted on their merits. Uh, men tend to benefit from this sponsorship. Um, there's evidence that there's a, there's a continuum. It's not just all bad for women, uh, that there actually are some good things going on. Although assimilation compared to, you know, inclusion is not necessarily the ideal space, compared to the other option, it's pretty damn good. And um, it, although it doesn't improve advancement, it actually improves many personal and organisational benefits. It's the minimum companies could do for women, isn't it? Um, and inclusion appears to be fa fairly elusive. Um, and, it can, you know, we, career advancement isn't being fully realised. If we have a look at the company types that are more likely to have that, they're much, much smaller companies. So they're the ones with very high levels of social inclusion, so you'd imagine they'd be the next ones to tip over or have already tipped over. And then I think there's a career typology model that describes six profiles of professional women, two of you what, um, that are still to be fully realised, uh, that we haven't got to yet. 
So thank you very much. Thank you both for such amazing presentations. Um, I'm reminded of the, the sort of rather pat description or of what's the difference between diversity and inclusion. Diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being invited to dance, <laughs> to actually participate. And you're both talking about how this, this active participation, it's more than being present. It's being absolutely part of it. And the really depressing part about the either uh, the birth of children or the potential for birth of children being this, um, this barrier that is both self-imposed and opposed, imposed from above, which I find completely horrifying that it still exists because arguably over the centuries and millennia, women have had children and have managed <laughs> a life and a career. So to have it still there is just extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and Valerie, um, your career models, um, I know they've just hit social media uh, <laughs> and they will be echoing throughout. And sadly, I think we can all see ourselves sitting in that. Mm. Sitting in one of those boxes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, it's still a continuum between each of them, but, yeah. but I th still think it helps probably women see that there is some options, particularly if you're in, a, in an organisation that's very much excluding you. Um, but it also helps women maybe understand the situation that they're in and the fact that they are actually often altering themselves and changing themselves slightly to be within the organisation. And then the big thing that I'd really like to really uh, work on next is to try and understand what it is that women bring about uniquely because I think women bring different things you know men are measured on that project it went really you know there was terrible things happened but then you got it back on track that was really good maybe women are actually just making sure the project doesn't go badly on off off <laughs> so then it's, it's always seen that they've had an easy project that was quite an easy project that they had so so there's sort of certain things that we can't really put our finger on that we're are not necessarily being measured from a promotional aspect um, so that's the sort of the next stage for me so I guess the question for both of you is you've talked about women being much more likely to hang around and that's yeah. probably something to do with the, um, because the, they don't want to have to start again mm. or they feel comfortable or the pay packet's coming in. There's, there's the, uh, they're lowering risk somewhere mm. along the line. Should they just go bugger that and it's time for me to move out around and take advantage of my capital? Yeah, well, I, I think they should, but I, it depends where they go to um, because they may go from the frying pan into the fire, uh, unfortunately. But I do think it is interesting that a number of those senior women have left, and I've bumped into them in various places. And one of them was very clear. She said, I was being paid a lot, but I wasn't valued for what I brought to the practice. And she, she was one of those uh, women who had specialised, and quite typically women specialise into practice management because it can be wrangled around uh, childcare and things like that. And she was an extraordinary practice manager. Like, she, everybody was lined up, she knew what everybody was doing, she made that practice really hum. But they didn't value it because they were off on their sort of like creative. I'm a genius architect. Shit. <laughs> um, that's what they were into. And, and, and the fact that they could only pretend to be that because she was organising all, all the stuff. And it's a classic female position, isn't it? Yes. You know, the, the, the woman mm. behind... Yeah, the handmaiden. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, th I think um, when you look at what the pattern is of women who advance, they, they do move around a lot to start with, often probably because they're not getting the opportunities, so they move to find them. But then they experience different places. And then I think probably they get to the stage where they go, this is probably as good as it's going to get. Yeah. And then if they stay there, you know, eventually it does sort of happen. So, you know, I think it's a matter of um, hanging in there. I think with construction uh, compared to architecture, that moving around, I mean, 
you know, it, it's, it's a high risk thing moving to another organisation. Uh, and it's, it's difficult maybe for you to start your own company because maybe your experience is in, you know, very, you know, um, very, very, very large projects that need an awful lot of capital to start them up. So, you know, so it is, it's, a, it's a difficult road and maybe they just sort of stick to what they've got because they know that it could be maybe a bit worse or, or whatever. Yeah, what they know. <laughs> I know. So I'm going to open it to questions from the floor. Yes, so oh, well the hands are going up, off they go. I can <laughs> see one right at the back. <laughs> right at the back up here. Several up there. Hi, um, my name is Ewan Wong Summers. Um, I'm an architect in my mid-30s and I took a career, career back break for four years and I'm about to become one of the statistics and leaving the industry altogether because while I find my while I'm raising a young family rewarding and my life experience grow exponentially, I do find the prospect of going back to work and really dwindling. Uh, I think there's three barriers I perceive that I have. First is your, your skill is so dated, like for four years, like people are doing diff using different softwares. And there's a lack of um, continued career development when you take that break. Um, and also second or four is the um, is to establish connections or re-establish your network um, when you're out of the industry for that long. It's, I find it extremely difficult. Um, I think last of all is to, to find out the, the right practice that will value your experience while put it accommodating bringing up a young family. So I think my question is, it, is if the workplace is not providing um, this kind of support, is there a tribe I can go and finding support in bringing down these barriers? Or if there's no such a tribe, how do I go about starting one? So, mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, look at Parla. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is a very difficult position. If you, some people, uh, they organise returning before they leave. They negotiate what's going to happen and how they might return. But you're in a different position and you've not had anything to do with anything. I, I, would, I would start going to various uh, architectural events and things like that and, and putting your face in front of people and talking to them. But I do think you probably need to sort of work out what you can contribute, uh, um, your experience, what might what might be particularly uh, valuable to a firm in, in that. Um, sometimes you can offer something like mentoring to, to younger people. You can sort of go, look, I can't deal with the software anymore, but I know how a building goes together. I know this, that and the other. I can mentor a whole team of young people working on a, on a project or something like that. So have a, have a think about that kind of thing. Um, there was one woman who I interviewed, and she works three and a half days a week, and she runs projects on site, and she can handle projects up to about $8 million on three and a half uh, uh, days a week. And the firm really like it because if they gave it to a full-timer, it would expand full fill that full-time. But the fees were limited, so they sort of said, three and a half days, sweet. We pay you that, that's what we're getting. So that can actually really work. You can sort of go, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm efficient. I know, I know how these things work. I, I'll just add as an employer, um, I know that women who are part-time with families are the most efficient people in the world. <laughs> uh, and you often get more work out of them than you might out of a full-timer. Uh, I think it's worth... What, that you want to exploit him? No, no, and it, it is actually one of those things that's a bit concerning. But it it's also working lo looking for employers who know that, yes. who know the value of part-time workers and know the value of people who are being efficient at what they do. Mm. It's not about the time being there. Yeah. It's not about <laughs> being on site and just presenteeism. Yeah. It's about efficiency. Can I, I just add one thing? I think the other thing is that sometimes you can lose a bit of confidence in yourself by yes. being out of the workforce and perhaps even doing something like coming and teaching, uh, running a studio. Uh, you've got lots of experience there. You know, you, can, you could maybe get into another network through that way or um, some further education. See, I'm always trying to get more people back in. <laughs> 
<laughs> there was another question up the back there. Hi, my name's Vicky Watts. I'm actually a builder slash quantity surveyor. I've gone back to work after 18 years of not working. So I want to give you a warning. It's not just kids, it's grandparents. <laughs> and, you en and you've actually got four of them if you're mm. married. Um, so the, the demands on you can be beyond just children. Yes. So I kept working with my first child. It was the second child that I stopped working. And then there was the grandparents. So it can take a long time to come back. So my suggestion for the industry um, is that we need to have pathways back and we need to have some sort of system where the teaching that you get in the last year maybe that looks at the standard form of contracts that are used, the software that's used, whatever's up to date, that you can go and um, find that information again when you're older. Um, you know all the basics, you know how a building goes together, you know how to do waterproofing, but you don't know what the new standard form of contract is because you've been out of it. Um, so it would be an opportunity perhaps for the university. I know the institutes, various institutes, attempt to have online learning and things for CPD, but my question is, is that actually up to date enough? Is that what you're going to find when you get back to the company? The other thing that happens, in my case, 18 years, you think how long? 14 years working, 18 years out. All your contacts have retired, mm. or perhaps even deceased. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and I, I, it's really difficult to get a reference. How do you go apply for a job? You ring up somebody, they've not worked for 10 years, or five years, or however long. You, it's really difficult to re-enter. And not only that, the um, online, job employment agencies, they don't sort of cope with older people. So re-entry, and look, it might be 10 years. Nobody's going to be as extreme as me. But even if you're out for five years, you've lost your contacts and you're out of date. So we should look at nursing. Nursing, I think, is fantastic that they have retraining. We need to, as an industry, find a way to retrain women because we can't afford to lose all that expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that you, people might consider is keep your institute membership. It's much easier to keep it, pay the money, and then when you want to return to work, you don't have that hassle um, of re-qualifying with the institute. So just fork out the fees um, and just do a bit of CPD so you're not totally out of date. Okay, thanks. That's good. Thank thanks, you. Vicky, and there's, welcome back to the industry. There's one down the front here. Thanks. Um, it's a question from a, a Sydney tweep who's following us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> serious question for, for, for Valerie. Of the women at the good end of your continuum, those that are satisfied achievers, how many of those do we know, could we speculate, have wives or husbands like Jacinta Ardern does? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think that's, um, I mean, we, we, we know that we don't have a lot of them, uh, but anecdotally, when you meet people in the industry who are really um, progressing well, they often do have a husbands or a wife at home who don't work, uh, or they're, um, they, they um, are child free, um, or those sorts of things. They've got, you know, there might be um, more support around them. It could be that they've got, a, you know, a mother who looks after their children, you know, so every day. So it's still a binary support It, it system. still is, yeah. yes, yeah, it could well be. We've probably got quite time for one more question. Yes, up the side here. very much for the presentations. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the focus of the presentations rather than the nature. Uh, because it seems to me that it has to do with the relationship between employer and employee or inter-employee relationship. But that implies a particular world of architectural practice which is a corporate one or medium and large size firms. Now this is an hourglass industry. Very few firms with a lot of people and a large number of firms with very few people. And so what is the reason for having decided to focus on the large size firms when in fact a lot, lot, most part of gender imbalance is actually to be found in the very small um, 
size um, band of practice. At the moment in Europe, 3% of sole proprietorships are by, um, um, owned by women. The rest, the 97% of small firms is actually owned by men. So why that focus? Well, I, partly it's being based in a university and you need partners to do this research and it's only the big firms that have the money that can you know, uh, contribute to, to that. But I would also say that the people that I interviewed have worked in firms of all sorts of different sizes and although the classic career trajectory for an architect is to work for the big firms, and then set up your own firm and build it up, blah, blah. Um, there was actually quite a lot of traffic going the other way. People from small firms moving into the big firms. And sometimes it was a sort of financial reality of running a really small practice. But also, um, one of them sort of said, you know, I just got bored with doing fancy houses for very wealthy clients. It just bored me in the end and I wanted to work on bigger projects. So you, I, I think there is movement the other way. Um, I think it is, you know, it's true and of course when you have a, a, a small firm, you can have a, a principal or a director who's a total tyrant. Uh, but they're not all like that. And um, I think it is very true in architecture, possibly less so in the construction industry, that there's a massive range of firms, from the tiny to the huge, from the supportive to the um, total nightmare, who think if you're not there 24-7, then you, you are just not dedicated enough. Um, and that can happen in all sorts of different sizes. So I think the patterns um, uh, uh, happen everywhere, and it doesn't really matter on the size of it. But it's easier to uh, study them in the larger firms. And patterns is what we've been talking about, and it's a fabulous place to draw this to a close. Please join me in thanking these two wonderful <laughs> presenters.